Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Aurora is back once again, and she's challenged me to another game, another exciting variant of Nim. As usual, we have a pile of ducks between us, in this case 16 of them, and we'll take turns removing them. The first player can take away any number of ducks, but not all of them, since that would be a bit too unfair. So, I might take away these five. Then, on each following move, a player can remove up to twice as many ducks as were taken on the previous turn. I took five, so Aurora could take up to ten. In this case, she'll choose to take three. Then, I could take two, and Aurora would take another one. Then I could take two more, and Aurora would take the rest and win. Good game. I'm getting tired of losing these games, so I'll need a better strategy. What can I do to win this game the next time we play? And what interesting math can we learn along the way? Now, this isn't our first rodeo, We've analyzed games like this one on the channel before, and the first steps are always the same. Identify the possible positions, and figure out who wins for some small games. We'll set aside the first move of the game for a moment, since it follows slightly different rules. For any other move, we've got a position that can be described by two numbers. The size of the pile, and how many ducks the opponent took on the previous move. And whenever we have something described by two numbers, it's natural to put it into a table. Okay, those are the positions. Now we want to classify them by which player wins. Notice that if there are no ducks left, that is, if the pile size is zero, then the player who just moved wins. In game theory terms, these are P positions, since the previous player won. Also notice that if the size of the pile is at most twice the previous move, then the next player can immediately take all the ducks and win. We call positions like those N positions. Okay, then how do we fill in all the rest? As we've seen in past videos, a position is a P position if a player can only move from that position to N positions. And a position is an N position if the player can move to at least one P position. So, for instance, from this position, where the pile size is 3 and the previous move is 1, the player can remove 1 and end up with a pile size of 2, or remove 2 and end up with a pile size of 1. Both of those are N positions, so this must be a P position. On the other hand, for a position like this, with pile size 4 and previous move 1, the player can remove 1 to end up with a pile size of 3. And that's a P position, so this must be an N position. And continuing in this fashion, we can fill in the rest of the table. What about the first move? Well, if we have a pile of, say, size 5, we can take one duck away, and leave a pile of size 4, or we can take 2 and leave 3, or take 3 and leave 2, or take 4 and leave 1. In other words, we can move to any position on this diagonal, except for the one with pile size 0, since that corresponds to taking all the ducks on the first move, and we said that's not allowed. Since all of these are n positions, that means that the starting position with five ducks must be a P position. 
In other words, the second player can always win. If instead we started with a file of size 6, that would correspond to this diagonal. And there's a P position in there, so the starting position, with 6 ducks, is an N position, and the first player wins. And we can do this analysis for any size of starting pile. It's pretty tedious to calculate by hand, since we have to fill out this whole table, but tedious calculations are exactly what computers were made for. So we can code this whole process up and have the computer spit out the results. When we do, we see that the starting P positions are 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. Hang on, I've seen those numbers before. And you've read the title, so you are probably wondering when the Fibonacci numbers would show up. And that's not all. If we look at the end positions and their corresponding winning moves for the first player, we can see that those all look like Fibonacci numbers too. But why are they here? To answer that, we'll need to look at an interesting use of Fibonacci called the Zeckendorf representation. Let's say we have a number like 42, and we want to write it as the sum of Fibonacci numbers. Well, there are a lot of ways that we could do that. For instance, we could write it as 34 plus 8, or 21 plus 13 plus 8, or any of these different ways. We could even write it as the sum of 42 ones. But that kind of feels like cheating, so maybe let's add some restrictions. First of all, we don't want a big pile of repeated terms like this, so we'll add the rule that there are no repeats. That eliminates sums like this, this, and this. And remember, these are the Fibonacci numbers we're dealing with, and they're defined by the relation that the sum of any two consecutive Fibonacci numbers gives us the next one. So there's something weird going on with Fibonacci numbers and consecutive terms, so we'll add the rule that we don't want any consecutive terms either. And that rules out sums like this and this. And it seems like that's enough to leave us with just one representation. And that turns out to be true in general. Every whole number can be written uniquely as the sum of distinct, non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. This is known as the Zeckendorf representation. Finding this representation is pretty simple. We take our number, find the largest Fibonacci number we can fit into it, and subtract that out. So if our number was 100, we find the largest term that fits in, in this case 89, and subtract that out to get 11. And then we repeat until we get down to zero. So the largest term that fits into 11 is 8, which leaves us with 3. And then the largest term that fits into that is 3, it is a Fibonacci number, and that takes us down to 0. So the Zeckendorf representation for 100 is 89 plus 8 plus 3. And it's not too hard to show that we'll never get consecutive terms from this process, so this is a valid Zeckendorf representation. And with a little bit of modification, this method can be used to prove that the representation really is unique. I'll leave that as an exercise for you down in the comments. This is all a bit abstract, so let's build some intuition for these Zeckendorf representations by drawing a picture. Say we have a number like 27, which is 21 plus 5 plus 1. We can draw this as a row of rectangles of the corresponding lengths and height 1. So these have lengths 21, 5, and 1, and the total length is 27. 
and we can do the same for any other number. So 33 would be 21 plus 8 plus 3 plus 1, so it would look something like this. If we do that for every number below 55, we get these. And if we stack those together, we get this big triangle here. It looks like there's a bit of structure in there, so let's color code these rectangles by their width. And now let's take out the lines between blocks of the same color. Huh, that's a pretty picture. And now we can start to see some patterns. For instance, the rectangles from each row line up nicely to form bigger rectangles. Each of those rectangles has its top right corner on this main diagonal. And in fact, the height of each of these rectangles is just the previous Fibonacci number. So these have size 34 by 21, 21 by 13, and so on. For practice, you should try to prove these properties from our definition. Also, as an aside, we can see a bunch of repeated parts in this picture, as well as parts that look a lot alike, but at different scales. And sure enough, these rectangles all have aspect ratios, which are the ratios of consecutive Fibonacci numbers, so they're pretty close to the golden ratio. So these rectangles are all approximately similar. And that means if we scale everything up, we get almost exactly the same picture. In other words, we've found a fractal. I suspect this fractal has been studied before, but I haven't been able to track it down. If anyone knows more about it, let me know in the comments. Okay, the second dwarf representation is pretty cool, but how does it help us win our game? Let's take another look at our list of positions and winning moves but this time we'll also include the Zeckendorf representations for the n positions. And just from looking at this list, you might already have picked up on a pattern. It looks like the winning move, if there is one, is to take the smallest Zeckendorf term. So, for example, with 7, which is 5 plus 2, we should remove the 2. And for 12, which is 8 plus 3 plus 1, we should take 1, and so on. And that's not just true for the first move. In general, it seems like if we can remove the smallest Zeckendorf term from any position, that's a winning move. And if we can't, there's no way to win. Does this strategy really work? And if so, why? To answer that, let's try it for a few moves to see how things play out. Let's start with a pile of size 42, which is 34 plus 8. Our strategy tells us to remove that smallest term, 8, and leave the opponent with 34. Can the opponent do the same? Well, no. 34 is a Fibonacci number, so the Zeckendorf representation is 34. And that smallest term, 34, is more than twice 8, so that's not a legal move. So instead, they might do something like take 4 to leave 30, which is 21 plus 8 plus 1. And then we can remove that 1 to leave 29, which is... 21 plus 8. And again, the opponent can't remove that 8, because it's more than twice 1, so they have to do something else, like, say, take 1, and leave 28, which is 21 plus 5, plus 2. And we can remove that 2, but then our opponent won't be able to remove the 5, and so on. Well, it certainly seems like something's working. 
These turns are alternating between us removing the smallest second dwarf term and the opponent failing to do so. But this raises three important questions. Why can the opponent never remove that smallest term? Why can we always remove the smallest? And why do we end up with the win at the end of the game? Let's tackle those questions one at a time. First, why can the opponent never remove the smallest term? Well, when we hand the position to the opponent, we've just made a move where we took away the smallest second dwarf term. Let's call that Fn. And the second dwarf terms are non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers, so the smallest remaining term must be at least two Fibonacci numbers larger. So it's at least Fn plus 2. And these are Fibonacci numbers, so Fn plus 2, by definition, is Fn plus 1 plus Fn. And the Fibonacci sequence is increasing, so Fn plus 1 is larger than Fn, so this is greater than 2Fn which means the smallest term left to the opponent is more than twice our previous move. In other words, the opponent can't remove the smallest term. Next, why can we always remove the smallest term? That is, why does the opponent's move always set us up to make our next move? We can answer this by relating moves in this game to sizes of rectangles in our second dwarf diagram. At the start of the opponent's move, they'll be in some position, maybe this one, and we've just shown that they can't remove the smallest second dwarf term. So after their move, they'll end up in one of these positions. Whichever one they choose, they can't get as far horizontally as the left side of the rectangle they started on. So the rectangle they end up on must be stacked on top of that starting rectangle. In other words, the height of that rectangle is at most as large as the opponent's move. As we noted earlier, each of these rectangles has width and height that are consecutive Fibonacci numbers and the ratio between consecutive Fibonacci numbers is never more than 2. It can be exactly 2 for 2 by 1 rectangle, but it's usually closer to the golden ratio, about 1.618, which means the width of this rectangle is never more than twice its height. The move we'd like to make is to remove that last Zeckendorf term, which is the width of this rectangle and that's at most twice the height, which is at most twice the opponent's move. So we want to make a move that's at most twice the opponent's previous move. That's always a valid play. Finally, why does this back and forth with the Zeckendorf terms give us the win? Notice that the final move, when the pile size becomes zero, must involve removing all of the terms from the Zeckendorf representation. In particular, that means removing the smallest term. And we've shown that the opponent's move can never remove the smallest term. So we must be the ones to make that winning move. That was all a lot of information, so let's take a moment to recap what we've seen. First, we described positions in our game in terms of the size of the pile and the previous move. And we classified those positions as either P or N positions. That is, whether the previous player to move or the next player could guarantee the win. Then we noticed that all of the starting P positions and most of the winning moves from N positions were Fibonacci numbers, which led us to explore the Zeckendorf representation, the way to write a number 
as the sum of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Finally, with the help of our Zeckendorf diagram, we proved that if we removed the smallest term in this representation, our opponent couldn't do the same. And if the opponent didn't remove the smallest term, then we always could. And the winning move had to remove that smallest term, which meant we would win. So we've fully described a winning strategy for Fibonacci NIM. Time to put it all together and challenge Aurora to a rematch. Once again, we have 16 ducks. But this time, I know what to do with them. The Zeckendorf representation for 16 is 13 plus 3. And the smallest term is 3, so I should remove 3 ducks. Now, Aurora can take 1, leaving me with 12. And 12 is 8 plus 3 plus 1, so I should remove 1. Then Aurora might take 2, leaving me with 9, and 9 is 8 plus 1, so again, I should take 1. And Aurora could take 1, leaving 7, which is 5 plus 2, so I should take 2. Then Aurora might take 3, and I can take the rest and win. Good game. I always enjoy learning about games like this, especially when there's beautiful math hiding just beneath the surface. If you know any other interesting games you'd like to see analyzed, please let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.